We want to welcome you to the Southern Hope Church of Christ online service this week. We're going to open up with a word of prayer and then a couple of songs. Please pray with us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity just to uh, pray and to be about your word today. Lord, we just pray you please bless this service and help it to be beneficial to all who hear it. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
begin our text today in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, starting with verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, starting with verse 1. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me there. The text says, The words of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all his labor? And which he toils under the sun. Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning to its on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome. The more one can say, the eye has never enough seen. The ear has its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. There is, is there anything of which one can say, look, there is something new. It was already here long ago. It was here before our time. There is no remembrance of men of old, even of those who are yet to come, will, be, will not be remembered by those who follow. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you made. We thank you for the blessings that you have given us. And, and God, as we just come into this time of study, we just pray your blessing be upon us to understand your word a little bit more. So please strengthen God and direct us in all things and help us to do your work and your will. And please just give me the words of wisdom to explain your word accurately today. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Today we're going to be wrestling with the question, is the Bible too old? Some today debate the usefulness of the Bible because they claim it's too old. In other words, one of the arguments that people have for not wanting to believe the Bible, not hearing the Bible, not listening to the Bible today, is they say that it has nothing to say to our modern age. Well, is that an accurate claim? Is that an accurate problem? Well, today we're going to take a look at that. We're going to see just how old the Bible is. We're going to talk about why that, that excuse is not valid. And then we're going to get to the heart of of that excuse. You see, even though people claim that the Bible is very old, it still has a message for us today. It is a timeless book with a timeless message that is meant for us today. Well, let's just jump right into it and let's just ask the first question here. And let's talk about the age of the Bible. Just how old is the Bible? When we take a look at the Bible, we see that the first book of the Bible was written nearly 1,000 years before Jesus walked the earth. What we're talking about there is when we go back and we look at the book of Genesis. Genesis was written by a guy named Moses. And Moses lived on this earth 1,500 years before Jesus came to this earth. So when we look at the book, even when Jesus was there, it was 1,500 years old, almost as old as what the Bible is to us today. And yet Jesus still used it as authoritative. Jesus still used the teachings of Moses as they still were authoritarian in his day. The New Testament book was written nearly 2,000 years ago. When we take a look at Matthew through Revelation, they were all written in about a period between depending on who you're looking at, between 30 to years or so after Jesus' resurrection. All of it would have been completed by no more than 60 years after Jesus' resurrection. So we're looking at about 2,000 years ago that the entire Bible was completed. From the first book of, the Gen of Genesis till now, Genesis is 3,500 years old. Revelation is 2,000 years old. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is going to talk about the Word. Jesus correctly prophesied that the Word of God would not disappear. This can be found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, starting with verse 18. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, starting with verse 
18. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. When we're talking about the books of the Bible, even though it's been 2,000 years since the last book was written, it has still stayed on this earth, and it still has a message for us today. Now, first of all, when we say this, understand that the Bible can be examined with nearly 25,000 manuscripts that's out there. When we start talking about looking at the Scriptures and looking at the Bible and seeing how well tested it is, we have over 25,000 different manuscripts we can go back and compare the Bible to. And see that we know for sure that we have the right scripture. We have the exact words that the authors meant for us to have. Not only do we know by looking at the manuscripts, but this next point. Because it was written in dead languages, we know exactly what they mean. For 2,000 years, the Bible has been well preserved. We have confidence in this. We know that this book is accurate. The Word of God has been persecuted, but it still stands today. Man has tried to shut the Word of God. It has been chained to pulpits. It has been tried to be taken out by evil kingdoms and evil countries. But time after time, people have tried to disprove it. The Word of God has still stood, has still stood strong after all these years. We can have confidence in the Word of God. It may be 2,000 years old, but it still has a message for us today. But when we're looking at this, I don't think that the people are actually rejecting the Bible as much as they're actually rejecting God. Now why would I say this? The entire Bible comes from God. From Genesis to Revelation, all of it comes from God. And this is the testimony the Scripture has about itself. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting with verse 16. The book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Not only do we have that testimony in Timothy, we also have it in 2 Peter, chapter 1, start with verse 21. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 21. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the testimony we have here is whenever you're arguing with the Bible, you're not really arguing with a book. You're not just arguing with men that lived 2,000 years ago. You are arguing with God. You are questioning God. You're not questioning Peter, James, and John, or Moses, David, and Daniel, you are actually pointing the finger at God. Because this is His Word. This Bible comes directly from Him. When we talk about God, we know that God is all-knowing, including but not limited to the future. Then in other words, God is a timeless being. He is not bound by time. In fact, He created time. He can see the past, the present and the future all equally. He is the only being who can do that. And as such, he's not limited by just current information like we have when we write a book. No. In fact, one of the tests of the New Testament, or excuse me, one of the tests of the books of the Bible was looking at the message that God gave to see if it came true. If you will, look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22. The text says this, For the prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. In other words, if a prophet comes up and, he, and he's giving a message, but that message does not come true, God is saying, He is telling us, it didn't come from him. Because God knows the past, the present, and the future. And God does not change. A perfect, all-knowing being does not have a reason to change his mind. 
If God changed His mind, He wouldn't be God. God knows what's coming in the future. God knows. God knows what's in your heart today. He doesn't change. Scripture testifies to this in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. What we see in this is whatever God thought 2,000 years ago, it's what he still thinks today. What God thought 3,000 years ago is what he still thinks today. What God thought 6,000 years ago is what God thinks today. And if this world continues for another 10,000 years, his mind still will not change about morality, about truth, about religion. Our God stays the same. God is also the creator. And therefore, he knows all of his how all of his creation works. In other words, since God created the world, the universe, since he has created mankind, since he created the family unit, since he created all these things, he knows how it works. We have a testimony that God created all things as far back as Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Genesis 1, 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything that God has Everything that we see out here, God has created. And God knows how it functions. And God knows how it works. We're still learning. We're learning things about the human body. We are learning things about this earth. We are learning things about this universe. Every day we're learning something new. God designed it. There is nothing in heaven or on earth that surprises Him. Since all this is true, God can write an eternal word for all generations that does not need to change. If I write a book, it will need to be changed at some time. It will need to be updated. Because new facts will come out. There are things that I am limited about. There are things that I don't know. So if I wrote a book today, a year from now it may be outdated. This happens all the time. But with God, who knows past, present, and future, who knows how creation works, who sees all things. Only He can write an eternal book with eternal truths that never need to be updated, that never needs to change. So what we're truly doing, we're not actually doubting the Word as much as we're trying to limit God. We're trying to rob Him of His majesty. What we're saying is, God, you don't know what you're talking about. What we're saying to God is, you're not all-knowing. What we are saying about God is, there's things you're still learning. You're still evolving. You're not an all-perfect, all-knowing God. We are robbing God of His majesty when we say this. We are robbing God of who He is, and we're speaking blasphemy. You're not doubting the Word. You're doubting the One who created the and that's a problem. Why do we do this? Because it's not God's problem, it's man's problem. Man has had a problem since the very beginning of time. From the very beginning, man wanted to be his own God. That's the problem. Once again, we're going back into Genesis chapter 3. When we look at what Satan actually tempted Adam and Eve with, it's actually being their own God. Genesis 3, starting with verse 4. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Sin is trying to knock God off of his throne. Sin is trying to tell God, you're not the king. You're not the ruler. I am. I am taking your place, God. That's what sin actually is. And that's what makes sin so bad. It's treason. It's blasphemy. It's wicked. It's evil. In order to do this, man must deny the Scriptures. It's what Satan got Eve to do. It's deny the Scriptures. It's what he's still trying to get us to do. When you go back into Romans chapter 1, in Romans is setting the stage of 
the problem of sin and why there's sin in this world. And when you're looking at Genesis chapter 1, start with verse 18, notice what it says. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks for Him. But their, futile th but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became full, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to their shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They became filled with wicked, with, and they became filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They're, they disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree, those that do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do these very things, but also prove of those who practice them. What we're seeing here is, is that from the beginning, when man wants to sin, what they got to do is go say, the word of God doesn't say what it has to say. God didn't really mean it. There is no truth. What we do is deny the scripture over and over again. And when people say, isn't the Bible too old? What we're doing is just using another excuse to say, we shouldn't have to listen to God. Man is still trying to deny God's word with excuses. 2 Peter chapter 3. Start with verse 3. First of all, you must understand that in the last day, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forgot that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. The same word... The present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment, destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. The same excuse of what we find here in 2 Peter is the same thing we hear today. People say, well, it's been 2,000 years. Where is this Jesus coming? It's been 2,000 years. The world still goes on. For an eternal being, 2,000 years is like two days. Time is relative to the person. When I was a child, my father used to say he was a mechanic. He'd say, come out with me. I've got a job to do. It's a short job. When I was a child, I think a short job is five minutes. Like five minutes, we're in and out. For a mechanic, short job is an hour or less. I didn't know I was going out to the hot hay field while he worked on a hay baler and a tractor for over an hour. Because to him, that was a short time. For me, that was a long time as a kid. For God, 2,000 years is a short time. For us as humans, that's eternity is what it feels like. God is not slowing and keeping his promise. He's trying to give us a chance to repent. The 
problem is today, man is even denying that there is a truth. People are saying, there is no such thing as truth. There's truth for you, there's truth for me. We can't even tell if there is a truth. And there are no absolute truths. It's crazy. Some things are truth. Yes, there are some things that are opinion. It's my opinion that the University of Kentucky is a better basketball program than Duke. It's my opinion that Kentucky is the best state to live in. It's my opinion that America is the greatest country in the world. But then there's also facts. You need air to breathe. You need gravity to keep you on this ground. Those truths do not change. There is absolute truth. And even in morality, there is no such thing as opinions. There is truth. When it comes to Scripture, there is no opinions. There is truth. There's not truth to you. It's not the way we interpret it. There is a truth that God has outlined. Truth is eternal. It does not change. If it changes, it's not truth. Truth, God's truth, is eternal. And today we're taking a look at this lesson and, and we understand that yes, the Bible is old. Nobody is doubting that, but but truth is eternal. It doesn't change. And the reason it doesn't change is because we have an eternal God. An eternal God who is all-knowing, all-wise, and has put things together. And man is sinful. And man has been looking for ways to deny God since the very beginning. Morality is not something that can be voted on. Truth is truth. Whether we're talking about the type of relationship of a man and a woman... And not anything else except for marriage between one man and one woman. Whether we are talking about whether stealing is acceptable under certain circumstances or not. Whether we're talking about what is life and who should be saved. Truth is truth. And what we need to argue about is not opinions, but truth. Are you seeking truth or are you seeking opinions? You know, one of the problems is, is we have great technology. In fact, we have technology we're using right now. And this technology, in many ways, has changed some things in the world, but technology only gives us new avenues to do either good or evil. Technology doesn't change truth. It just gives us a different avenue to do something good or do something wicked. It does not change the eternal truths of God. Sure, when Paul wrote, he probably didn't have the internet in mind. When, when John traveled from town to town, he probably didn't think about the automobile or airplanes. But it doesn't change the truth that lying is wickedness, adultery is a sin, that marriage is still something ordained by God, that there is one way to heaven, and that the scripture teaches that way. Denying eternal truths only hurt you. No one else. You can deny whether sin is sin. You and I can have great discussions about whether sex outside of marriage is good or not. Whether living together is just as good as marriage or not. Whether the sins of homosexuality is the same as heterosexuality. We can discuss those things. And I'd be willing to discuss all those things with you. But the truth of the matter is, our opinions don't change it. There is a truth. There is a God. Are we seeking that truth? Denying eternal truths only hurts you. The eternal truth is this. Jesus Christ died for our sins because he lived the perfect life. And after he was buried in that tomb, he resurrected three days later, and he tells us that if we want to be saved, we have to believe he is the Son of God. We have to believe. We have to believe that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We've got to be willing to confess him as our Lord and Savior. 
We've got to be willing to repent of our sins. And repent means to turn around, turn away from our sins. Walk a new life. And we've got to be buried by baptism, by immersion, for the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And be faithful to Him to death. Some of you who are listening may not have heard this before. This may be new to some of you. You may even be asking, well, what do I need to be do to what do I need to do to be saved? Believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. If you have questions on that, please feel free to message me. Whether you're using YouTube here, whether you're using Facebook, whatever you're using, Twitter, let us know. At this point, we want to close the sermon part of the service out with prayer. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, please help us to never deny your truth. Please help us to always be faithful to you. And please forgive us for where we have sinned and failed, failed you. And please help us to be faithful to your word. Praise in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Here at Southern Hope Church of Christ, we always like to offer a opportunity to be around the Lord's Supper. And I know today we're not here physically. In the book of Acts, we read this. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. We've, we've had the apostles' doctrine or teaching by reading the Word. We've had our time of prayer. and Fellowship, even though we're not here together, we're having fellowship through the Internet. We're going to offer an opportunity for the Lord's Supper. Jesus told us on the night He was betrayed, when he instituted the Lord's Supper to do this in remembrance of him. It's his memorial. And tonight, or excuse me, today, what we want to do is if you're at home and you have the emblems, if you have the bread and you have the cup, whether it's wine or whether it's grape juice, we're going to have a moment of prayer. We believe in the Lord's Supper so much that even though we're not here physically, we are together. And we want to invite everyone who's out there to participate. What the Lord's Supper is, is remembering the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is remembering our sin and how unworthy we are. It is a prayer of thanks to God for forgiveness of our sins. So if you're home and you have the emblems, if you have a cracker somewhere, and if you have some form of grape juice or wine, if, if you want to pause the video for a moment to go get it, I want to ask everybody together, that after prayer, to take a moment and to take the Lord's Supper with your family, or if you happen to be at home by yourself, to understand you're not really by yourself. The church around the world today is doing this together. So we're going to have a moment of prayer. And then um, if you are taking the Lord's Supper, I'm just going to ask you to please just pause the video until you're done, because we're going to give an offering meditation as well today too. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just give thanks that you are the great God and that you did die for our sins. Please forgive us of our sins. Please forgive us for where we have failed you. But Lord, please bless this time with this cup and this bread. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. One of the things we want to do with the Lord's Supper is also have an opportunity for offering out. Well, here's the thing. Some of you out there may not be in the church, and I understand that, and offering is for the church. We don't ask the world for money. We ask from Christians. And even though you're at home, there is still ways to give. If you can't give physically to your church, there's plenty of other organizations out there that you can give your money to. And by the way, guys, there's a lot of people who are in need. This was the church's attitude in Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 44. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods. They gave to everyone as he had need. The early church was a giving church. And Christians should be known as givers today, too. If you have the opportunity to set aside money for your offering, we ask that you do that. Whenever the church can meet physically again, you can give the offering then, or you can mail it in to your church. Whatever it is that you need to do. If you're not a Christian, and uh, I'm not necessarily asking you to do anything. 
If you're a Christian that's in between churches, I just ask you to find a good mission somewhere to give to. For the people at Southern Hope Church of Christ, I'm just asking you to remember today you still have your offering. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you made. We thank you for the blessing you have given us. God, we just pray that you please bless whatever is given to the glory of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank everybody again for coming and uh, being a part of this service. I know it's a little bit difficult. I want to thank Mariah for coming out and having music with us today. I was hoping that everybody was able to sing along with that. I hope that the message was a blessing for you today. Uh, for the church, uh, I just want to say, whether we're physically together or not, we're always together. Hopefully we'll be back together in church service again soon. I miss you all. But until then, we just want to lift up everyone in prayer. So we want to have a prayer of closing at this point. Heavenly Father, God, we just, we are surrounded by uncertainty with sickness, with people with their jobs, being told to stay home, all kinds of things, Lord. Um, at this point, we just pray that your blessing be upon this nation, be upon this country. Please forgive us for where we have sinned and for where we have failed you. But please also help that this, this crisis would end soon. In another way too, Lord, we just want to pray for our people in the medical field. They're in the front lines. And the people who are delivering groceries and the people who are in stores keeping us fed. And, and the police officers and the first responders out there doing their job. God, there's lots of people out there who really need our prayer. Please keep them well. Please keep them safe. We thank you for this opportunity to gather here. We pray that it was found pleasing in your sight. Praise that in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.